The 2019 Overwatch World Cup has officially come and gone, and with it we saw some historic results. There was a lot of good and some bad as well that came with this event, and I actually have a lot of thoughts on the World Cup this year, so I thought in today's video I would do a review of it all. There's three things I wanted to focus on in particular in this video though. One is the good of the event, one is the bad, and I also wanted to go over some teams that both surprised me and a few that disappointed me. Let's get the bad out of the way first though. So what did I not like about the 2019 Overwatch World Cup? Well, first off, on the final day of the event, there was an absurd amount of ads being played. I mean, holy moly. I talked to people who had ad blockers installed, and they were still getting ads. It was honestly kind of ridiculous. Now, I know you need to make revenue and all, but why do you have to spam me with like nine ads all in a row? I was just trying to relax by watching the games through my Xbox so I could watch it on a nice big TV, but that ended up being a really bad decision because of all of the ads. Now, most of the time, they were pretty good with their timing by hitting me with the ad cheese during breaks and in between matches but there were a few occasions where they actually played ads during the matches themselves. During one occasion, Denmark was getting close to the end of their attack in a map against South Korea, and then they hit me with ads at a super suspenseful moment, and that's just unacceptable because I ended up missing Denmark finishing the map because of it. I'm sorry, but you don't see the NFL playing ads during the final play of a game, do you? That stuff just never happens, and usually I would just have to refresh the stream afterwards because the ads would end up making my frame rate drop when I finally came back to the stream for some reason. The quality quality of some of these streams were kind of scuffed. I don't know if it was just me, but when there were multiple games going on at the same time during the prelims and groups, the quality of some of these streams felt really off. The sound quality of the commentators felt too loud at some moments, and on some of the streams, the gameplay looked choppy and it kind of felt hard to follow at times. I'll give them some slack though since there was a lot going on at once and it was pretty chaotic, but there's definitely a lot of room for improvement with this and I'm kind of disappointed. Other than those things, the only other complaint I have has to do with the funding. Even if most of these teams probably wouldn't get far. I think Blizzard needs to do a better job of funding these teams who don't have enough money to travel to BlizzCon on their own. We saw so many teams have to drop out because of funding issues, and it's honestly not fair. How many teams had to do fundraisers just to ensure that they could make it to BlizzCon? Every country who wants to participate should be allowed to go, and I'm really hoping that we see this issue get resolved in the future. And if Blizzard can't really do anything money-wise, I'm really just praying that they spread awareness next time some of these teams are struggling to make enough money. Like, just do something. Okay, Okay, let's lighten up the mood now with some of the things I liked. So thing number one that I really liked about this year's World Cup is that somebody other than South Korea finally won the gold medal. For the last three years, South Korea have been so unbelievably dominant. There were times where they looked mortal like in their match against the USA in 2017 or with the United Kingdom in 2018, but nobody really came close to beating them in the end if you look at the total map scores. But that changed this year. Good on the United States and France for taking them down. Another thing I liked about this year's World Cup was that we saw a lot of newcomers in the playoffs. Denmark and the Netherlands had never made it out of the group stage before this year, so seeing some new faces was quite refreshing and both of these teams were popping off. They were honestly super fun to watch. Their journeys to make it here made it all the more impressive too. I know both of these teams aren't as good as in past years, but Denmark still took down Australia and Netherlands still dominated Finland during the prelims. And these are two teams that have a very good track record when it comes to making it out of the groups and advancing to BlizzCon. And then they follow up by advancing out of the group stage. Yes, it's true that they were participating in the weaker section of the two groups, but that still doesn't change the fact that they were the two lowest ranked teams in the national rankings during the groups with Denmark being ranked 15 and the Netherlands being ranked 11. But like with some of the other teams, these two showed that national rank does not matter in the slightest this year. Big shout out to the Netherlands and Denmark for accomplishing so much. Both of these countries are advancing greatly when it comes to closing the skill gap between them and some of the other top countries in the world. I mean, just look at how competitive they were in their playoff matches. Along with newcomers making it pretty far this year, I was also really happy to see less popular countries get more exposure. The prelims and groups did a fantastic job with this, and some teams really shine during their short time in the spotlight, and in some cases, it led to some epic matches early on in the event, like with Italy versus Japan, which went to a map 5. Non-Overwatch League level players getting the extra time in the spotlight is really good. It allows for them to gain more hype in a larger following while potentially gaining the attention of scouts both at the tier 2 and maybe even the tier 1 level in some cases. Although there was a lot going on at once with there being multiple streams up at the same time up until the final day, I still feel that the World Cup went in a positive direction with some of these changes. One of the main issues I had with the World Cup in the past was that it did not focus enough on the less popular teams. This year was a lot better with that though. 
And although I had classes during a good chunk of the prelims, it still felt like paradise being able to watch multiple games at once where I got to see players I don't know much about show what they've got. Moving on from the things I liked, for the remainder of the video now, I wanted to talk about some specific teams. I mentioned the Netherlands and Denmark earlier, so let's make a few points about them real quick. So in terms of surprising teams, for me personally, they both make the cut. The Netherlands were definitely a dark horse team to make it out of the groups even before BlizzCon happened, but to see them actually pull it off is still really impressive. Their solid showing saw them win two matches in the group stage while taking a map off France in what was a pretty intense quarterfinals matchup. Big shout out to the DPS line of Facility and Jonah. Those guys were popping off and they made for a really good one-two punch with their Doomfist and Reaper. I'm sure my good friend Wool will be really happy to hear me say good things about Facility. There's honestly no reason not to compliment the guy though. He looked very strong on that Theron Doomfist. He had consistent pop-off moments throughout the entire weekend, and I think that any praise he does end up receiving is well-deserved. As a unit though, the Netherlands were well-synchronized. The tank line in particular seemed to complement the strengths and cover up the weaknesses of the rest of the team. Now as we transition to Denmark, they fall under a very similar boat to the Netherlands. They've progressively gotten better and better over the last few years, and it kind of felt like it was only a matter of time until they finally broke through. But the way in which they did it is something else. Even in the groups, they were making their presence felt by playing China extremely close, even though the final score would tell you otherwise, and that ended up being their only loss of the group stage. And look at what they did against Korea. In one of the closest 3-0 losses I've ever seen, Denmark really gave South Korea all they could handle. In my opinion, with the exception of Oasis, every single map was tightly contested, and Denmark even extended this match a lot further than it should have gone through two draws. That one on Volskaya Industries in particular was just ridiculous. All South Korea needed was a single tick on point A with around four minutes in their time bank and they would win the map and the series. It seemed like Denmark was all but done for, but even with their defeat almost looking guaranteed at this point, the Danish defense stood strong with one of the craziest holds I've seen in a long time. Now I will say that South Korea this year wasn't as good as they've been in previous years and they were kind of throwing at points during their attack during this match, but all credit still needs to be given to Denmark for staying strong when the odds were completely stacked against them and after all, they did a good job of capitalizing off of South Korea's mistakes. I really thought this team did a nice job of rallying behind their experienced Overwatch League veterans. Shax and Kellex acted like true leaders in my opinion. They each led by example in a different way. Kellex did so through good positioning and ult usage on Lucio, while Shax did it through his absurd hard carry moments on Widowmaker and Reaper. And it seemed like the rest of the team was feeding off of this energy. Fissure in particular was just a huge contributor. Definitely need to give him credit as well. If Shax wasn't the one dominating, he usually stepped up on that Doomfist or Hanzo. The next surprising team I wanted to bring up now is France. What else is there to say other than that they completely surpassed my expectations this year? I mean, they shattered them beyond belief. Even after losing out on Unko not wanting to play this year and Poco dropping out because of health concerns, they still ended up getting through the groups. And I'm not sure how the rest of you felt, but I personally thought that France might not even win a single game in the groups. And after getting completely steamrolled by the United States in that first game, I thought for sure that my initial judgment of them was spot on. But then those boys made me completely eat my words by ripping off three straight wins in the group one of which came against South Korea. Their ability to bounce back after a rough start allowed for them to finish the group in second place with a 3-1 record. Even if South Korea wasn't as good as in past years, finishing above them is still a noteworthy achievement. And then they follow up by securing a playoff win over the Netherlands and playing China tough for a good amount of their set against them. They failed to win any medals yet again this year, but finishing in the top four when most gave you little chance to even get out of the groups is definitely eye-opening. Behind the leadership of Soon and the big plays made by Leaf, this team thrived. And I mean, Leaf in particular particular was just a standout performer, not just on France, but in this World Cup in general. I mean, my goodness, this guy dominated. Saying he carried is putting it lightly. In my opinion, he had one of the best World Cup showings in recent memory. It was like Flower in 2017 almost. He had that much of an impact in my opinion. He was easily a top DPS player from this event and it's not even close. His Doomfist and Pharaoh were just ridiculous. Leaf crushed it. He was receiving a lot of hype from this event. Many fans will even argue he should have won MVP. And to be honest, I have no way issues with this at all. He was in my top three actually. He would have deserved it completely if he won it in my opinion. Along with Leaf, FD God and Tech 36 were also pleasant surprises for me. Those two surpassed my expectations with their Sigma and Lucio play respectively. France in general though just did much better than I anticipated. Even Hip got in on all of the action with a sleep dart onto Jin Mus Genji that just looked crazy. Even if they didn't get the bronze medal in the end, France should feel very proud of what they accomplished. They silenced their doubters and their haters by playing out of their minds this year. The final team that surprised me is the United States. I know that may sound dumb 
because they were already one of the stronger teams heading into this event, but they far surpassed my expectations. Only losing one map through the groups in two playoff games is pretty crazy, and in many of their games they were just rolling whoever was in their way. Other than South Korea and the United Kingdom, nobody even made their maps against the US in the groups remotely close. And even so, those matches against the United Kingdom and South Korea were still 3-0s at the end of the day. The USA took this event so seriously, and it shows in their results. After three sad years of losing in the quarterfinals, they broke through and took home the gold. This seemed like it would be their best chance of winning it all with the type of roster they assembled, but I personally didn't think they'd end up pulling it off just because they're known for being these chokers in the World Cup. I thought this would be the year they make it out of the first round, but never did I think they'd play as well as they ended up. That hard work at boot camp with the assistance of a good coaching staff ended up being more than enough. The US were tired of being a laughing stock, and I think that Rockus and Sinatra in particular had really big chips on their shoulders with them being part of the previous two teams before this year. This meant everything to those guys. They went into this BlizzCon with a humble and focused mindset and it shows with how they performed. It should be expected from somebody like Sinatra since he's an Overwatch League MVP and champion, but never in my wildest dreams did I think Rockus would play as well as he did. And to be honest, I think I owe Rockus an apology. I called him out saying that this was the wrong choice for the roster, that they should have picked Sleepy or Dogman and that Rockus would be a liability, but for the most part, that wasn't true. I don't think I've ever seen Rockus play this good before. He wanted redemption more than anything in the world. Not only did he want to do his country proud by bringing home the gold, but he wanted to make a statement. Rockus is sick and tired of all the hate clearly, and I think that in an effort to silence his critics, he played the tournament of his life. He had some iffy moments here and there, especially in that gold medal match against China, but overall, I would say he more than got the job done. He actually looked really good in the Korea matches in particular. The guy popped off. And as usual, Space, Corey, and Moth were consistent contributors, which is honestly nothing new at this point. Moth is just an insane Lucio, and he proved that yet again in this tournament. Then Space did a fantastic job on Sigma, very impressive stuff from him. And Corey was just bonkers with some of the plays he made on Reaper and Symmetra. I mean, seriously, Corey put on an act of brilliance. Corey and Space actually performed at such a high level that I thought they were deserving MVP candidates alongside Leaf. Those were actually my top three in no specific order. No disrespect to Sinatra, he was great, but I think there were definitely some more deserving. MVPs out there. But that's what happens when you let the fans have total control over the voting process, I suppose. It becomes a popularity contest at that point, so of course Sinatra would get the most votes. Now, before I move on from the US, I also wanted to give credit to Super. He played well above my expectations. You could tell that he's been working hard to improve his Orisa because he looked pretty good on it during this tournament. Sometimes he would struggle and look like a weak link on the team, but he still played so much better than people give him credit for. And how about that Reinhardt Symmetra strategy the US ran? Who else do you know who can mess up South Korea using Reinhardt against Double Shields? That Symmetra Rhine strat was just so sick. Now for some closing thoughts. So first off, I'm super proud of my country for finally living up to the hype, and I'm eager to see how they fare next year now that they finally have proved themselves. Congrats to the United States. This was the ultimate World Cup revenge tour for them. They got the revenge on the United Kingdom for that 2018 embarrassment, and they got payback on South Korea for 2016 and 2017 by taking them down in the groups and then eliminating them from the playoffs. Okay, with that out of the way, Way, let's quickly go over some disappointments I had. So let's get the big one out of the way first and talk about South Korea. This was the first time where they actually looked super vulnerable. After never losing once in three years, whether it was in the group stage or at BlizzCon, South Korea lost three matches this year. I know it may sound dumb because they still got a top three finish, but they were disappointing this year. This team has a high standard with how much they dominate the pro scene, and they were kind of a letdown this year. I don't know if it's just me, but they looked shaky and just honestly unprepared at times, and during other moments, they were sloppy with ultimate usage. This especially goes for IDK, who really seemed to have a rough BlizzCon, but I believe he said he wasn't feeling good during the tournament, so that probably does help explain why he was underperforming. It really does make you question if the right roster was constructed, because most of the guys could have played a lot better. Like, for an example, as much as I love Mono, I don't think he was the right pick for this type of meta. I trust Krusty and his decision making a lot, but I personally would have gone with somebody who has a stronger Orisa. I don't think Mono necessarily played awful during the World Cup, but his Orisa has always been the weakest part of his game. And I guess they could have picked a stronger support line too, but this team overall, it's not like they're bad. It's not a terrible team. This just wasn't their meta in my opinion, and when you combine that with sloppy play, then you have a recipe for disaster. But hey, at least Carpe, Architect, and Hoxel to a certain extent were all popping off. It was getting a little annoying hearing people call Carpe washed because, you know, he did have a disappointing 2019 season in the Overwatch League, but he's still Carpe. 
Anyone else remember him turning around a fight single-handedly, basically, against the UK? That was vintage Carpe, and it proves that he is not washed. And I honestly think he did just fine even when Korea was losing. Architect, as I mentioned, also looked quite strong, so it's not like this team had no idea what they were doing, but I feel that most of their players still just didn't have a great understanding of the meta. They had playmakers, but the execution was just off. I'm expecting Korea to come back with a vengeance next year, though. There is no way they are satisfied after this year's performance. Two more disappointing teams in my eyes were the United Kingdom and Sweden, and the reason I'm linking them together like this is because I feel that both of them deserve some slack even though I'm being hard on them here. Yes, they didn't do hot in the groups, but in their defense they were in the much harder group. If they were in group B, I think one of them could have maybe gotten out of the group stage or at least have gotten more wins than they did, but at the end of the day, they still had a combined record of 1-7 and seven with a map differential of 5-19, and 19, which is anything but impressive. What I noticed with Sweden in particular is that their supports were a huge letdown. I did not like what I saw from Gustav or Epps at all, but in a general sense, it kind of felt like everybody was underwhelming on Team Sweden. Lulcic and Elivolt weren't all that great, and Snillo, who was the veteran of this roster, was kind of slacking during certain moments. Nobody seemed to step up and be that difference maker that Sweden so desperately needed. I was confident in them coming into this year's World Cup, I thought they had a really promising roster, but that confidence quickly turned into worries when Italy seemed to be giving them all they could handle during the preliminaries. Then with the UK, I had higher expectations for them than most, I would say. Even though this isn't their meta, I kind of just had this confidence in them that they would be able to run through the group for some reason. I really liked the team they constructed this year, but instead they didn't get a single win, which definitely caught me off guard. Fusions on that Arisa proved to be a slight issue, and it seemed like this team relied heavily on their DPS to bail them out of tight spots. This especially goes for KSP, who had himself a great BlizzCon, I'd like to add. One of the other big problems I noticed with the UK is that they couldn't seem to stop Farrah, Bastion, and Tracer, strangely enough. Those heroes were giving them serious problems. But even though they didn't win a single match in the group stage, I think they deserve a little bit of credit for how competitive they were. I know the amount of maps they won would tell you otherwise, but they gave both the United States and South Korea a serious challenge. Hopefully the UK and Sweden come back stronger next year. Now for the final team I quickly wanted to bring up. Let's talk about Canada, shall we? Now I know they weren't expected to be as strong as they were in previous years, but when you have won a silver and bronze medal in the last two World Cups, you're expected to do a bit better than you actually did this year. Not having XQC for the first few games definitely hurt them since Agility found himself playing Orisa, which went about as well as you'd expect it to, but even when XQC got subbed in, it was still a total disaster. One map win in four games is not a good look, and with this being the same team from last Last year, it's kind of disappointing to see them regress so much, but when you have XQC who hasn't played professionally in what feels like ages, plus Agilities who had to fill in for him for a couple of games, it is kind of hard to imagine them going far, but you think they'd be able to muster up more than one map win. The XQC disadvantage, plus this roster not being super comfortable playing this meta, was just too much for them to overcome, I guess. We know Canada's capable of being so much more than this, though, so hopefully they work hard to regain that form in 2020. And with that said, that is going to wrap up my review of the 2019 Overwatch World Cup. What did you guys think of this event? Make sure to let me know down in the comments section, and let me know if you're interested in seeing some more World Cup videos, too, because I was thinking of dropping a few videos that focus in on specific teams. So if that is something you would be interested in seeing, then make sure to let me know. And if if you enjoyed this content, then I would appreciate it if you could hit the like button and sub to the channel if you're new. You can also further interact with me by following me on Twitter at ATP Overwatch and by joining my Discord server through the link in the description. And as always, thank you all so much for watching today's video, I really do appreciate it, and until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.